week on WealthTrack, financial thought leader Michael Mobison targets some cherished Wall Street beliefs, including the roles activity, skill, and dividends play in investment success. Leg Mason Capital Management's chief investment strategist, Michael Mobison, is next on Consuelo Mac WealthTrack. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market, Wintergreen, your home for global value and Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Most of us have been brought up with the belief that to be successful, you have to work hard. And the harder you work, the more successful you ought to be. We are taught such is the case in just about any human endeavor, starting with elementary school and extending through one's entire professional and even personal life. Well, this week's financial thought leader guest says not so fast. Yes, hard work and activity pay off in most pursuits, but there are some where less is actually more. And wouldn't you know it, investing is one of those anomalies. We'll find out why and how to use it to our advantage. Then there's the role that skill and luck play in life's pursuits. As this picture illustrates, it turns out there are certain activities where skill reigns supreme. Chess and track, for instance. And there are others where luck holds the cards, the lottery and roulette wheel. Where does investing fall on the skill luck continuum? That's right, it's over on the luck side. How do you overcome that? Be prepared to have some of your most dearly held investment beliefs challenged in the next half hour. The protagonist is financial thought leader Michael Mobison, chief investment strategist at Leg Mason Capital Management, where he writes his thought-provoking Mobison on Strategy commentary. Author of Think Twice, Harnessing the Power of Counterintuition, and More Than You Know, Finding Financial Wisdom in Unconventional Places, named one of the best business books by Business Week. He is also a highly regarded adjunct professor of finance at Columbia Business School. I began by asking Mobison to explain why doing more as an investor doesn't get you better results. Most of us grew up in a world where we were taught hard work leads to more results. And so we want to translate that work ethic into everything we do. It simply doesn't work in investing. And the main reason is most of us, what we really want to do is obviously buy low and sell high. But what we actually do is buy high and sell low. We tend to want to acquire assets that have done well recently and sell things that have done poorly. So often more activity leads to poor ultimate returns in the portfolio. And I'll just tell you one little story on this mm -hmm. to, to, to make this more concrete. There was a study done by a couple of academics and they studied over 3,000 endowments, pensions. You know, these are the big money guys, mm -hmm. the really smart guys. And they looked at their hire and fire decisions. So which money managers did they hire and which did they fire? And as you'd expect, the ones they hired are ones that done recently really well. They outperformed their benchmarks. They were looking great on paper. And the ones they fired, they had a bunch of reasons to fire, but the number one reason to fire them is that they'd underperformed their benchmarks, right? Very logical. But then they came back and revisited those same money managers two years later. And what they found was the fired managers did better than the hired managers. So that action, which of course was trying to improve the perform performance of the portfolio, actually ended up ended, uh, sending them back. And it turns out other academic studies across asset classes, across different uh, investor groups, find very similar things. So often sitting tight and doing nothing, while difficult, is the best course of action. So you just talked about some actions that professionals do. So what are the kind of mistakes and the kind of actions that individuals do and, and professionals do? Right, and it's, everybody does the same. Up. Everybody does the same thing. So the main thing individuals do is they buy things that have done well. If they hear about it or they see about it, they get very excited about it. So what you, you call course, recency bias. Recency bias. Right. So the big examples, of course, is who wasn't buying internet stocks in the late 1990s, right? They're zooming every day. You want a piece of the action. 
who wasn't getting involved in real estate in the mid 2000s, right? It was very exciting. So people participate pretty much at the wrong time. And when things are very depressed, no one wants to talk about them or they tr try to avoid them. And uh, you know, the statistic, which I know that you guys talk a lot about on this show, but it's always worth reinforcing is, if you look at the returns for mutual funds and you look at the returns for investors, they're consistently lower. And you say, well, how could that be if they're investing in mutual funds? The answer is bad timing. They tend to buy high and sell low, and that is very deleterious to long-term returns. So the best advice typically is find things that are cheap when they're fairly unloved, buy them and hold them. So let me ask you about the buy and hold strategy because that got a very bad name in the last decade because in fact, if you had purchased the S&P 500 index fund and you held it for 10 years, you lost money. Exactly. So, so, so it's not quite that simple, right? That's I mean, right. So, so I guess the question is, so how do you decide what to buy? Exactly. And then, and then how long do you hold it? Well, I think the answer is buy cheap and hold versus just buy and hold. And right. So there's a key element of the in initial valuation. So for example, let's go back to 2000. It's a great point. S&P 500 was trading in something in the high 20s, low 30s on a price earnings multiple with right. some metric evaluation. By the way, it was very depressed in 1982 and it had a basically a 20 year great run. Small caps at the same time, small capitalization stocks were, were really quite cheap. In fact, if you look at the value line index, they have a median PE multiple and the median of that group at the same time the S&P was peaking was just 13 times. Wow. Which means that half of the stocks they followed traded below 13 times. So if you had bought the S&P 500 on that day and held it, you would have done uh, quite poorly. But had you bought the small cap index, for, for example, you would have actually had a pretty satisfactory decade. So it's not just buy and hold, it's buy cheap and hold. And that's the key thing to insert in there uh, to deliver good returns over time. Michael, you've written about the role that skill and luck play in investing. To my great chagrin, <laughs> you have discovered mm -hmm. that in fact luck plays a great role in, in investing and investing results. So why is it that investing relies more on luck in many respects than it does on skill? Let me start by articulating kind of a continuum in life between pure skill, no luck, and pure luck, no skill, right? So pure skill, no luck would be like a running race, right? You line people up and the fastest person's gonna win pretty much every time. Pure luck, it's the roulette wheel or the lottery or something like that. And almost everything in life is somewhere in between. So the question is, where is the combination, uh, the relative co uh, contributions of both? Now, in there's a very interesting idea called the paradox of skill. And what it says is when everybody's really skillful at something, the skill basically cancels out and what becomes important is luck. So I think investing is very much in that realm. The reason it's so hard to beat the market is because everybody's really good at it. Everybody works really hard at it. Everyone's working with basically the same information. So that makes things pretty, pretty efficient for the most part. And so uh, I don't think it's all luck, but I think it's closer to that luck side of the spectrum. As a consequence, by the way, it means you really do have to think about longer time periods to be able to assess a strategy or assess a particular manager because it's only over time that the skill will shine through. In the very short term, it tends to be very noisy and very lucky. So Michael, what skills do make a difference in investing? I think there are really three things to look for. One is what I would call an analytical edge, and that really has two components. One is investors who are consistently looking for differences between price and fundamentals and that specifically the, the asset price misspecifies the, the potential outcome for the fundamentals. The second thing is once you have an edge, an advantage, the other key thing is how you position it in your portfolio. Specifically, when you have a really good idea, it should be a bigger part of your portfolio and the idea is not as good, it should be a little bit smaller part of your portfolio. It might be like a racetrack bet. If you've got a really great racetrack bet idea at the, at the horse track, you should put a lot of money into it. If it's not such a good idea, less money. The second one is behavioral, and uh, there's been a wonderful literature on behavioral finance over the last 20 or 30 years, and there are specific traps or biases that we all tend to fall for. We tend to be overconfident, we tend to anchor. The key for an investor is to learn about those things, and more importantly, is look for investors who've developed ways to manage or mitigate those potential mistakes. The other thing on behavioral is what I call a Mr. Market mindset. Mr. Market is a beautiful metaphor that was developed by Ben Graham, the father of security analysis and a longtime professor at Columbia Business School. 
And he had this wonderful metaphor for how the market works. It was this accommodating fellow named Mr. Market who would name a price every day at which he would sell his steak to you or he would buy something from you. And unfortunately, this guy had an uneven mood swings. And so some days he'd be very optimistic and want only high prices. Other days he'd be very pessimistic and would try to shovel everything over to you at a low price. The key is to recognize that he's not there to inform you, but rather to work with you. And you can ignore him if you want, but when he's offering high prices, you should be selling. And when he's offering low prices, you should be buying. The third and final one is institutional barriers. In other words, there's a lot of pressure for investors to be with the pack because they're worried about straying too far from everyone else or having a portfolio return for some period of time that's too far from, from everyone else. So they're institutional pressures and they want to be sort of with the group. And uh, overcoming one of these barriers, analytical, behavioral, or institutional, one or two of them is kind of hard, but overcoming all three is very, very difficult. It's the rare money manager who can do that, but that is what I would call the skill set that you're looking for. You've just said to have all three skills is very difficult to find them. So that tells me, number one, what should I do as an investor? And number two, then should we just invest in index funds? Is it really nigh impossible to find an investor that has these skill sets? Right. I would just say for most investors, if they're not inclined to spend a lot of time to try to figure out who the successful managers are, investment index funds are a great way to go. I've always believed that. They're low cost, they give you exposure to markets in a proper in a, in a, in a proper way. So the answer would be for many people, that is the right solution. If you, However, if you want to generate excess returns, you really do have to look to active managers. And that, if you really want to do your homework, that would be sort of a checklist or a set of templates to look at to try to do that. So for most people, if you're not inclined, index it. If you are inclined, you want to go for excess returns, use that as a template to try to assess who's going to, who's going to do a good job for you or who's not. So Michael, an another you know, thing that you've written about, which is so interesting, it really shatters a, a myth that most of us have, and, and that is the fact that you know, we know statistically that dividends have contributed a great deal of stock returns, 40% plus over the last 200 years. But, but you are saying that dividends, in fact, if you look at the real role that dividends have played in investment returns, it is not as great, and that you should really take a look at that. So what is the real role that dividends have played right. in our investment returns over the years? So there are a couple really crucial issues here. The first one is that when people talk about returns for an asset or a stock, they often talk about total shareholder returns. And just to explain what that means, it means if you have a stock that pays a dividend, that you are taking 100% of that dividend and reinvesting it back over the, in the stock over time. So uh, it turns out in real, the real world, very few people actually do that. And it's also that assumption ignores taxes. So it doesn't assume you pay any taxes. So when a financial advisor, for example, says the total shareholder return of the, mar the, the stock S&P 500 has been some number, you have to acknowledge that that includes reinvestment of 100% of the dividends with no taxes. So that's the first thing just to be mindful of. The second thing is, of course, if you think about it, what it matters to you as an investor is your capital accumulation rate how fast your dollar will grow over time. When you're reinvesting dividends, this is why the real role, this is the real role thing. You're, when you're reinvesting, it's the key the thing is realize is you're not, it's not something extra. In other words, if you have a $100 stock and it pays a $3 dividend, what happens is one day you're gonna have a $97 stock and a $3 dividend, right? So if you reinvest it, you'll be back to 100. So it's price appreciation is the only thing that shapes the capital accumulation rate. That's the key idea. Price appreciation is the only thing that affects your capital accumulation rate. So what's, what's interesting to me about that is that, uh, that we have, we've been told to look at the total return. And, and we've also been told that you know, cash in the hand is, you know, is better than you know, two, two dollars in the bush or whatever. Right. So, so in fact, um, if, if we really want to focus on what the capital accumulation is from price appreciation, does that mean that we should look at different types of stocks? Right. And it turns out uh, there's nothing wrong with dividends. I want to be right. clear about that. And in fact, we know that over long periods of time, dividend paying stocks have actually done quite well. They've er grown their earnings at very satisfactory rates and they've done quite well. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's just to be very clear that that only works, that argument only works if you reinvest 100% of your dividends in an un unencumbered fashion. So studies of, of what people actually do, most of us take that dividend and we go off and do something else with it. We either spend it, we consume it, or we use it to buy some other asset class. So the key is that those total shutter returns can be very, very misleading. So as a value investor, you think that there is actually tremendous value to be found in the stock market right now. What, what's so attractive about the stock market? 
Well, if you just take one step back, the key is we talked about before is valuation, and you want to own things at an attractive valuation. And when you look at the S&P 500, for example, the largest index, um, it depends what numbers you use for consensus for 2011 or 2012, but we're, we're probably under 13 times based on 2012 estimates. Uh, price earnings multiple. Price earnings multiple, correct. And historically, and that's Historically, where? it's been quite a bit higher than that in the mid-teens, called 15 or 16, but the key thing to consider in that is also interest rates, right? And particularly, risk-free rate. So the 10-year Treasury note yield today is around 3%. Right. So uh, there are now forecasts that the excess returns for owning stocks over the risk-free rate is about 5.3%. So that, that's assuming a, a return on stocks of like 8.3%. 8.3%. So the, the relative attractiveness of U.S. equities versus our, our, fix on, our government fixed on markets are really, really uh, good today. What about the fact that the Federal Reserve has been buying 10-year treasuries up until now? Exactly. And, and, and in fact, so that couldn't that be an artificially low risk-free return at 3% in the 10-year treasury? I think that's very likely. And in fact, you could even make that argument and go back in, in time because, for example, we've had very steady buying from Asian central banks, in particular China. And there have been estimates that that has depressed the yield somewhere between 50 and 150 basis points or half a percent to one and a half percentage points. So I think that argument's been true. So the key is to look at the absolute expected returns for equities. And you pointed out in your math a moment ago, it looks like it's a little bit over 8%. And going back to the same fundamentals, as we know, balance sheets in corporate America, there may be lots of worries at the federal government level, uh, and there may be some balance sheet concerns for individuals, but corporations are still in really good shape. Uh, we're, we're still probably, you know, we're, it's fits and starts, but we're probably the earlier phase of the recovery. The recovery continues. And um, a lot of these large companies and these S&P companies, they're, they're multinationals with great exposure, and they're trading at relatively bargain basement valuations. So when you look out three to five years and you say, uh, how do I look at bonds versus stocks, they really do look quite attractive. Let me ask you about behavioral finance. And, and the fact is that, that you have said earlier that, that behavior is key to understanding the markets and to understanding your role in it. So, so, so give, me, give us a little bit about kind of what's the, the leading edge thought now in in behavioral finance and, and investor psychology. What do we need to know as individual investors? Well, there's, a, there, I mean, by the way, this is not only a fascinating literature, it's a really important literature. And it's, it's not just investing, but it's really all facets of your life. The way I like to think about this is when we're faced with certain types of situations, this is all of us, our minds are naturally gonna wanna jog down one path when there's a better way to think about the problem. So you have to learn about those kinds of situations, almost build them up in a little mental ro de de Rolodex in your mind. Um, be able to identify them in context, to pick them out when you see them professionally or personally, and then finally develop tools and techniques to manage and mitigate them. So the first step is really learning about these things, and then the next step is managing them. So we have lots of different examples. So, I mean, so give me an example. Um, one, one of my favorite ones is something called the inside versus the outside view. And, and I guess I'll introduce this by telling a story of a racehorse, Big Brown. Um, three years ago, uh, there was a, along came a beautiful colt named Big Brown. He won the Kentucky Derby very convincingly, four and three quarters lengths. He went on to win the, the uh, Preakness, Preakness by five and a quarter lengths, even stronger. So he's one step away from horse racing immortality, right, which is the Triple Crown. And, and by the way, he had a trainer uh, who was gushing with confidence. He said, it's a foregone conclusion that my horse is going to win the race. And in fact, uh, handicappers weren't too far behind him. He went off at three to 10 odds, which if you work out the math, is about a 77% probability. So what happened in the Belmont, it was a hot and steamy day. Attendance doubled because people wanted to come see history right. made. And he made history, which is, he was the first triple crown contender ever to finish last in the last leg of the triple crown. So. What do you take away from that? This is the inside versus the outside view. And the inside view says, when we solve problems, all of us, the way we typically do this is we gather lots of information, we combine it with our own inputs, and then we look into the future. And that could be, when will I hand in my term paper? When will we launch our new product as a company? The outside view, by contrast, says, when I'm looking at my problem, I'm gonna think of it as an instance of a larger reference class. And I'm basically gonna say, when other people have been in a situation before, what happened? So now we can go back and look at Big Brown using the inside versus the outside view. Now the inside view is great looking cold, he's undefeated, right? And the trainer's gushing with confidence. The outside view would ask the question, what happened when other horses were in this situation before? And as it turns out, there were 29 horses in a position to win the Triple Crown, 11 of those succeeded. But here's the interesting thing. 
eight of the nine horses it tried before 1950 succeeded, like 90% success rate, but only three of 20 since 1950 succeeded, which is about a 15% success rate and sort of dampens your enthusiasm for, for Big Brown's prospects. And by the way, none had done it since 1978. Now your response to that might be, well, maybe he's just really fast. Maybe he deserves those odds because he's so good. And it turns out there's a way to measure that. It's something called the speed figure, which measures a horse's performance adjusted for certain conditions. Well, it turns out of the last six Triple Crown aspirants, Big Brown was by far the slowest. He was downright lead hoof compared to these other horses. So now we have two important pieces of information. One is a very low base rate of success, and by the way, not a particularly good horse trying. So he was clearly the favorite to win that race. I, I want to be clear about that, but at 77% probability, he's a massive underlay. It's not a big transportation to go over to financial markets to think about the same thing, right? The odds are basically the price, what is anticipated will happen, and the fundamentals are how fast the horse can run. And what as an investor you're always looking for is a disparity between price and fundamentals. Same idea, it's a little, little harder to do in investing than it is at the racetrack, but it's the same fundamental concept. So I'm thinking of the big brown equivalents. Uh, there are portfolio managers, for instance, who have you know, beaten the market. Bill Miller, Leg Mason, 15 years in a row, and then he didn't beat the market. Right. So, so th there's something that you talk about a lot called reversion to the mean as well. So, so talk to me about if I'm looking at my portfolio manager and they've, they're, they've had a, a streak, they've had a, a great run, very, no one else <coughs> did it besides Bill for 15 years, how do I apply that, that outlier, that outside the box analysis exactly. to my portfolio manager that I've invested in that's done really well? This is such a great question and such an important question, not just investing, but other facets of life. Whenever you see really, really good outcomes, you can almost always be assured that it combines skill and lots of good luck. Now we know skill may stick around, but we also know that luck tends to be transitory, right? Uh, fortune smiles on you one day and frowns on you the next. So when you see, and by the way, it works the other way. If you see really bad results, it's often because skill is not there, but there's often, often a lot of bad luck. And this sets up, as you pointed out, reversion to the mean. So for example, really good results, skill and a lot of good luck. Well, next time the luck may uh, go away a little bit and you're gonna see results a little bit closer to average. Really bad luck, luck gets a little bit better. You can see results closer to average. So this is the idea of reversion to the mean that over time, uh, you will definitely see that pattern. So recognize that great outcomes, and by the way, this is true for corporations as well as investors, when uh, the CEO's face is splashed on the cover of every magazine, it's typically he or she has enjoyed some good skill, but also lots of good luck, and the luck may often be transitory. So what do I do with that information as an investor again? And, and, I, and, I, and I, can, I guess I could apply this obviously to stocks that I invest in too. If a, if a, a company has had you know, a t tremendous run of exactly. good performance, you know, consistently higher earnings, what, is, what do I do with that? I mean, how do I apply the outsider view to succeed? One of my favorite lines is from Seth Klarman, who's the founder and very successful investor at the Bow Post Group. Right, hedge fund. Hedge fund, and he says, value investing is at a, is a, is a core, uh, the marriage of a contrarian streak and a calculator. And I love this. So the contra contrarian streak would say, when everybody's bullish, maybe you want to be bearish, when everybody's bearish, you maybe want to be bullish. So it's this idea of really going against the grain. But it's not complete because often the crowd is right, right? If the movie theater's on fire, by all means run out the door, right? Don't run in. So that's where the calculator part comes in. And it says, if you, if you see that everybody loves something or dislikes something, then apply the calculator. Figure out if there's a price to value discrepancy. And if both of those things line up, it's unloved and it's really cheap, then you step in. Or if it's loved, and really expensive, then you shed the position. So it's really the combination of both of those things that I think leads to great value investing. Very difficult to do emotionally, analytically, but I think that is the path to, to excess returns. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio that all of us should own some of in a long-term portfolio, what would it be? Yeah, I would say today, the biggest, most attractive thing to me is the difference between the S&P 500 and say the 10-year treasury. So I don't know if I can do a long short, but, but you know, just an S&P 500 index fund and uh, against that, looking at, it, again, a three to five year perspective versus the 10 year, I think you'll just, you'll do much better. I think the equity risk premium is very attractive and that trying to capture that premium, I think would be a great place for investors.
So we will leave it there. Financial thought leader, Michael Lobeson, <laughs> you know, you've given us some really just terrific research and, uh, and terrific ways to analyze this, these ver this complex system that's called the stock market. So thanks very much, Michael, for being with us. Thank you, Consuelo, appreciate it. On that note, we will wrap up this edition of Wealth Track. I hope you can join us next week when I sit down with great investor Stephen Romick, who has been in the top 1% of mutual fund managers for the past decade. He'll tell us what contrarian value strategies he is following now in his five-star FBA Crescent Fund. Meanwhile, please go to our website, WealthTrack.com, to see this program again as a podcast or streaming video. And while you're there, check out WealthTrack Extra where you can find complete extended interviews with other recent financial thought leaders and great investor guests. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us. Make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market, Wintergreen, your home for global value, and Rosalind P. Walter. Thank you.